author of Goliath, The Hundred Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy, a fellow at the Open Markets Institute, and the author, proprietor of uh, one of the few, uh, there's a couple that I uh, subscribe to, uh, newsletter, what they call Substacks, uh, big, uh, Matt Stoller. Uh, Matt, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, all right, Matt, so just, there's just, a couple- just, just to clarify so that I, I don't get anyone else in trouble. I'm actually at the American Economic Liberties Project now, not open markets. So, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, apologies. No, no, no. Um, no it's, people get confused. Okay. And uh, well, um, congratulations on that move. Um, <laughs> From one random nonprofit to another. There you go. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, let's talk about, I want to talk about, uh, um, actually, and if we have time, the last two pieces that you've written actually on big, uh, among other things, but the, one of the stories of our problem with vaccinations is a failure to produce the amount that, that we need to have at this point. But the other story, and we can talk about that a, a little bit too, but the other story is we have a failure of actually getting the vaccines into people's arms at this point. What, walk us through what the plan has been and, and why we have a almost a natural experiment as to um, how monopolies have been hindering this. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I wanna make it clear, the development of the vaccine was essentially miraculous. And so we have a vaccine in less than a year, which is astonishing. And that actually happened because of competition, because the government said, we're gonna put six companies up and they're gonna to compete to develop fact vaccines. And there were pretty good contractual arrangements. So this is actually, a, the development is actually a story of incredible, almost Apollo moon landing type of success. So like, let's not lose sight of that. I know it's like, it's easy to be like, everything is so bad because things are bad, but we should recognize that the, the competition policy set up by the government did actually work incredibly well. All right. Well, let's let's just uh, stay on that for a moment, too, so that we can uh, just give the people a sense of that, because I agree with you. And it's also it's a it's both a I mean, it's also a great story about government intervention um, right. and and setting up this market, if you will, I guess, this small market um, and um, and making sure that and, and providing the funding that really eliminated the risk for these different companies. Yeah, I mean, the, the mRNA. Uh, it's it, the reason we people don't look at it as a success is because it sort of violates the narrative because it's both a joint Obama Trump success. So everybody who hates Obama is like, can't admit that. And everybody who hates Trump can't admit, you know, that, but like uh, uh, it, the MRNA process, and I'm not a scientist, so I could butcher this, but, it, but the, the type of vaccine that we produced is a sort of novel type of technology that was funded by, I think by DARPA, which is a government agency in them in 2013, 14, um, because of the SARS as sort of one of the response to the SARS epidemic. And that technology has turned out to be incredibly useful in developing this vaccine. And then I think NIH and um, was, was helpful to developing the technology that Moderna used. And so the, the, the underpinning of the technology was government funded. And then when the, the government said, we're just gonna set up markets. We're just going to structure markets for these vaccines. And so we're going to buy, I guess, a hundred million doses from every company that makes vaccines, if they're able to produce a workable vaccine that's safe. And a couple of them did, there were a couple failures, but a couple of them did. And having a guaranteed market is really important if you're a business, right? If somebody, if the government just says, we're going to buy a bunch of stuff, then you know you have an end customer. That actually is the case with uh, personal protective equipment as well. I mean, we didn't have the capacity to build personal protective equipment at the beginning of the pandemic. We do now largely because domestic production, largely because they were selling into government stockpiles. So mar governments have this incredible capacity to structure markets, to finance research, to make sure that there's competition so people are spurred to innovate. And like, we shouldn't lose sight of what an unbelievable accomplishment these vaccines are. Uh, they're gonna be useful for all other. And also the vaccine technology was sort of, I think developed on top of a lot of technology that was developed to address HIV. There's a lot of government funding there, um, a lot of private innovation too. So let's let, you know, we, we we should just recognize that the development, we can do awesome things. Like, and that's important to recognize. I think that's, that's a, that's a huge point because uh, uh, um, 
far too often we lose that that narrative of what government can actually do. And we should just say it's the Pfizer and the Moderna that are our mRNA. The the Johnson and Johnson is a is a different technology. Um, AstraZeneca, I don't think it participated in this in these government uh, uh, um, uh, uh, programs. I think there's a couple others that are still sort of extant. But but the the bottom line is all of this was a uh, creating an environment for these companies that can build these things with the idea of like we're gonna we're gonna really um, uh, uh, mitigate your risk uh, that's associated right. with this. All right. right. So- and, and just just to also just to one more moral point. I mean, the Chinese vaccines are not very good. The Russian vaccine is good. Um, but one of the things that, you know, people are talking about how poor countries are going to take a while to get the vaccine and that's deeply immoral. And that there's a lot of kind of merit to that. There's a lot of problems in how we're building things out. But let's also keep in mind the fact that there's a vaccine is largely due to American, to uh, like the, this American system, right? And I know, I mean, it's like saying America is good or America is a useful project is not that popular on the left these days. Um, and it's important to recognize that this is this is the best of America. Like we actually did some great things, and there was collaboration. You know, the, the you know German there a lot of German innovation in this as well. So there's a there's a transatlantic effort. You know, the Chinese mapped the vaccine, uh, so we use the the genetic technology that which they got from us. So it's like this is actually an amazing global collaborative effort, along with kind of American competition policy that drove the creation of this vaccine. So. Kudos to humanity. We don't get a lot of that in 2020, but that was like, we should look at 2020 as this, you know, a, a pretty bad year, but also like kudos to humanity on that score. Well, right. Well, is it, is it, I mean, I'm just going to push back just a, a little bit. Is it non kudos yeah. to humanity? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I agree with a lot of what I hate saying, you, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I, 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 is a little bit of a Monday morning quarterback uh, kind of, uh, assertion to say it's competition that 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 drove this process say the united states was to more actively nationalize this effort and say hey pfizer moderna you're working with similar technology P- push this forward and work together and then maybe the stockpile would have been more effectively um manufactured i mean i i, I and 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 like you're saying the russian effort it seems like their vaccine is not as effective uh, as the mRNA technology, but 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 done pretty well in, in its own right. Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at it. I mean, so first of all, to, to look at this and say it's private companies that did it. I mean, it's not you're, you're right to like to recognize that there's a lot of public involvement here. Uh, the Chinese, I think you would look at China, which is ostensibly a communist state. They tried and it didn't work out very well you know, could have been random, could have been they used the wrong technologies or whatever. I mean, it worked out okay. It's not great. Um, what I would say is that, you know, having competition is not necessarily, so let's divide up the, the problem. So the development of the vaccine is one thing, getting it, making sure it's safe. And then the, co- the manufacturing of that vaccine is a different thing. And there are safety elements in the vaccine. So for example, a lot of people these days are saying, we need to like open source the technology and just get rid of these, the patents and whatnot so that anybody can manufacture it. In fact, when you're producing a vaccine, starting a new production with a new company still requires significant amount of safety checks. So the bottleneck isn't necessarily the IP, just because vaccines are very hard to manufacture. But what I think you're pointing to is that we really should have a national publicly owned and operated or publicly owned. Maybe it could be, we could do contract manufacturing like we did during World War II, but publicly owned vaccine production facility, right? And so you can have competition in certain parts of the market, but in some other areas where you want to have some slack that's not necessarily kind of efficient for private markets to handle you. I mean, I think having a you know, a public facility that does that makes a lot of sense. Right now, the government doesn't have the expertise to produce vaccines, I'm, um, but, uh, but they could hire contract manufacturers that do, which is what one of the ways that we run, like Lockheed has factories that are still owned by the US government, but Lockheed operates them. So there are models here that we can use for innovation and, and production. But you're right to say that there are, there are important areas where the government should step in, the public sector should step in and just sort of nationalize the process. I think that's right. Okay, so um, so that's that, that end of it. Now we're on to the distribution. And again, it would be great if we had more supplies. You'd have, I guess, 
more of a margin of error, but we don't have that margin of error. And presumably, right, we've known that at one point, we didn't necessarily know that we would have the vaccine this early, but we've known at one point, like, hey, if we get the vaccines, we're going to have to distribute the vaccines. So right. what was the decisions made in terms of how we were going to go about doing that and why? Yeah, so so this is, I wrote a piece about why chain pharmacies versus independent pharmacies, like they're, they're big partners in just vaccine distribution. And so I looked at the difference to sort of examine whether, you know, the whole framework by which we run our economy, which is effectively, we like big institutions because they deliver it, the, ostensibly they deliver efficiency, if that's really true. So there's a really nice natural experiment here. But just take a step back and look at the overall vaccine distribution. If you look at just globally, the U.S. I think is fifth right now, and you have Israel, which which has a, a fragmented health system, but it's but it's a um, so it's not. I don't think it's a Medicare for all style system, but it's a public system. They are just just overwhelmingly better than everyone else. I mean, I think they vaccinated fifty percent of their population because they really were you know aggressive you know and competent in terms of bureaucracy. Um, then you have, I believe, like and the let UAE me let me just let me just add. There is a, 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 a this doesn't really affect yeah, your no, point, I'm not but I've, about the Palestinian thing. That's not like that's a I'm just talking purely about the logistics and exactly. Deployment. Exactly. I just want to feel obligated that there is, a, you know, obviously a I think a, a legitimate controversy about who they have decided to uh, not right. vaccinate I mean, first. I mean, but it's, it's, but it's, but but as a operation in and of itself. Yes. Continue. Right. Just, like like moving the Palestinian Israeli conflict out of the discussion, which right. I think is probably obscures more than. Um, I agree. I agree. So um, the the England has done a the UK has done a very good job. I think they're number two. The UAE and Bahrain. I think one of them is is. I mean, one of them is essentially a city state. The other one is a done really well. Uh, and then the US. So the US is actually globally speaking, we are one of the best in the world at vaccine rollout, which is, you know, not necessarily great because it means that the rest of the world is kind of bad at it. But it, we're not terrible, right? We're not like globally speaking, we're like you know, we're up there. So, um, but the question is, it, we still, Israel is just so much, like they've vaccinated half the population and we vaccinated 10% of the population. So why is there this, you know, uh, and, and it's a problem because there's this new, more contagious strain coming and we really have to get shots in arms now. So there are production problems, but a lot of it isn't actually the production problem. You have, you know, states that are wasting inventory. Um, and what's really interesting is that in, the Trump administration said, we want everybody to sign deals with CVS and Walgreens, right? Every state, we handle it state by state. So a lot of the vaccine distribution is kind of contingent upon whether the state government is competent or not. And, you know, it's random. But, but, but one commonality is that, is that the Trump administration wanted everybody to use these chain pharmacies. And the idea behind CVS and Walgreens they, they're both acquisition machines. They didn't, they were pretty small in the 70s and 80s. They largely grew by buying other chain pharmacies and also parts of the medical supply system, like the billing system for drugs. Um, and uh, I think Aetna, which is a large health insurer, now that's owned by CVS. So these are giant healthcare conglomerates. The reason they bought all of these, um, you know, they bought, they bought their way to dominance and they were allowed to do that because our, are agencies that are supposed to enforce merger law, like the Federal Trade Commission and the DOJ Antitrust Division, which are the ones who give a thumbs up or thumbs down on a lot of these mergers, they said, okay, we like these mergers because we think that, that the combined entity will be more efficient. So if CVS and Aetna gets together with their billing system for drugs, which is called, um, I think it's called Caremark, they'll figure out some ways to deliver better care by combining all of their cool things together. Kind of like actually what you're talking about, Emma, with, with um, only instead of like the government running everything, it's a kind of private socialism where you have these giant kind of like efficient so private socialism, in a sense, that's. No, I don't. I, I think I. I meant more that the 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 it it would have been nationalized to a further degree as opposed to a competitive thing. So I mean, no, I, yeah. But. No, but and that's the same. It's the same argument. I know this is, sounds a little weird. It is actually the same argument for people that believe in. And not not saying you believe this. I'm saying the when you look at the um, at at economists who are arguing for mergers, they're usually just saying every merger will create more economies of scale. 
And then if you look at a lot of the people who are, who are arguing for kind of government ownership that means production, like traditionally I'm saying back in the, you know, years ago, they'll, they'll make the same argument. They'll say like Eugene Debs said this, you know, we're economies of scale, natural monopolies and all this. So it's, it's the same argument. It's just that one group wants public ownership. The other group wants private ownership. And that's the, that's sort of the argument of uh, why CVS is allowed to exist the way that it does. And Walgreens is the same thing. So what I looked at is, okay, well, is that true? Is, were there economies of scale in deploying the rollout of vaccines clearly in, in England with the national health service, which is a you know, a not just single payer, they actually own all the hospitals. It's been very effective. Um, what about in the US? And in there's one state that didn't use CVS and Walgreens at all, and this is West Virginia. And West Virginia just uses locally owned pharmacies. I, I think also, um, I think it's South Dakota. They don't actually, allow, or now, North or South Dakota, one of the Dakotas doesn't allow chain pharmacies at all. And so, the state governments said, uh, we will deliver our vaccine through locally owned pharmacies and that are usually owned by a pharmacist. And as it turns out, what happened is that it was a much better delivery system to go through the, the independently owned pharmacists because the independently owned pharmacists were more flexible. They had relationships with the nursing homes where they were trying to, um, where, where you know people needed the vaccines immediately. They had uh, more flexible information technology systems. They had data on all of the patients. In many cases, they had personal relationships with the patients. And CVS and Walgreens are kind of a nightmare. Um, they overwork their pharmacists. They, uh, their IT stuff systems seem creaky. They're large bureaucracies. It's kind of all the nightmare things you hear from Republicans about how bad the government is. CVS and Walgreens were that bad. And so we can just, I think, looking at the vaccine rollout, you know, where West Virginia has far outperformed most states, um, even though it has, it's a, you know, it's a red state, it's a different kind of governing style than, say, California, um, but, it, but it's far outperformed them. And one of the reasons, probably not the only reason, but one of the key reasons is because they went through locally owned pharmacies that were owned by a healthcare provider, aka a pharmacist. Now. So is the, uh, I mean, just to, to circle back, because I don't want to get too sidetracked on the on the on that. I mean, and I think uh, certainly in the context of what you mentioned with Debs, um, that efficiencies are part of that argument. The other part of that argument is um, essentially mission statement. I mean, the 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 last part of what you said with these individual uh, pharmacies, the perception of that individual phar- uh, pharmacist is that he's a healthcare provider or she's a healthcare provider. Right. They have a specific responsibility. Uh, to their clients, if you will, or their patients, uh, that I- that is um, that supersedes perhaps maybe sort of some like corporate balance sheet, which is part of the problem, obviously, with the Walgreens and the CVS. That theoretically, part of the argument on on socializing or nationalizing these things is you also the efficiency argument is in and of itself a, a separate argument. It seems to me you're also eliminating job number one being profits in that. I think, you, that's, I think that's right. I mean, I, I like, I think you, you do have can, slack in the system as you yeah, called like it. With the, the, the VA is publicly owned. It's very good. Um, the NIH in, in no, the, sorry, the NHS in, in the UK is, is amazing. They have great technology. I think you're right about that. I, I mean, I think the argument here is like the worst. So, so I think you could make a really good argument for locally owned pharmacies for distributed sort of ownership. Like that's one way to think about equality. Everybody gets a little piece of property. You could certainly socialize some of these systems. I think the worst scenario is to socialize the system, but also create like this weird financier ownership. So like right. Walgreens and CVS are effectively banks or financial institutions that as a side business own a health insurance company, own a bunch of pharmacies and own a, a PBM. Well, and so that that's that's like what's going on. So the, the other question I went to Let me just read back uh, uh, something that you wrote that I think really captures this. The basic confusion is that while there are some technical factors that make scale more efficient, these are often unrelated to legal scale. Right. Will you just uh, just tease that out so that people understand this dynamic? When we look at this BMF uh, CVS and think like, oh, they have it all there at their fingertips. They'll be able to coordinate this much easier. That's a fiction that we get confused just because it has the brand CVS on it. Yeah, no, this is a super important point. I'm really glad you brought that up. So, you know, oftentimes people think about economies of, so the key problem here is economies of scale. And they'll, they'll say, well, having a big company 
doing, you know, making steel or with a search engine or whatever. You need a big company to do all of this, right? And that's sometimes true, but it's confusing technical economies of scale with the legal economy of scale, right? So the internet is an insanely scalable institution, right? Or not even institution, I don't know what you call it, but it's a set of protocols and it's scaled by a factor of a million, 10 million, whatever, since the 1970s. It is not owned, it is not captured by a legal framework, right? It's not just, there, there are a lot of companies that are on the internet. And in fact, that is one of the reasons it scaled so much. It's because nobody controlled it. And so that's a, a, a technical scalability without the legal scale. And to, to break this down a little bit more, I mean, you could have like General Motors in the 80s was the biggest car company in the world. But if you looked at their factories, their factories were actually smaller than Honda's factories. And Honda was way more efficient at producing. So even though GM had this massive legal, legal scale because of the, the ownership structure, they owned all these brands and all these factories. In fact, Honda was taking advantage of technical economies of scale. So you got to separate out the, the ability to coordinate factors of production, like you know, from the actual legal structure. And they, the, the monopolists love to confuse these two things. And sometimes, unfortunately, so, so do socialists, but it's more the monopolists that like to do this. So for example, with, a, with a, um, independent pharmacies, it's true that there are some technical economies of scale when you create digital capacity for pharmacies and digital records, but there's no reason why a, a local pharmacy couldn't just get software to do it, right? There's no reason they couldn't get access to like to, to the scale, but also keep the independent ownership structure. One example of that would be hardware stores. Hardware stores, um, you know, you do have uh, Lowe's and Home Depot, but you also have a lot of independently owned hardware stores. And there is a, um, they actually, they actually are part of a co-op, a buying co-op that gives them the economies of scale of a Lowe's or a Home Depot, but they then get to be independently owned. I forget what it's, um, it's like the popular hardware store. Uh, Williams. Uh, and it's not Williams, it's a, but yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of them. All right. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, so that's, that's the, the, the kind of the key point here. Um, all right. Do you, I, I, um, I know that, um, uh, you, you have an out, but we, we started a little late. Do you have a little more time? Cause I would, I, I can go until 1255. Okay. I would love to just also talk about, cause you had another piece, um, about, uh, the profit in political violence as we're talking about, like, there's a, obviously you know people are getting demonetized on youtube people right. are getting pulled down on facebook and and this and that and that has been an ongoing i i i'm, I'm really curious to your perspective on this uh like what do we do about this some people say nationalize some of these big things um i i for one don't want the government to be in a position to have to make a decision about whose speech is appropriate or not, because then right. you start getting into actual legit first amendment questions. Right. But we do have a problem with these massive entities pumping out fake information or violent information. I mean, so how do we deal with this? Yeah, no, I mean, you don't want to get into like a Chinese social media dystopia, right, by combined fusing the power of the state and power of these big tech platforms. And that's where we're headed. I mean, that's what I think you could look at some of the demonetization. And, and uh, uh, so there's two basic problems here that are related. What is the scale and market power of these media, inst these communication networks, YouTube, Facebook, um, I think you could probably look, you might be able to look at Twitter, but like, basically these are governing, they, they have governing power and they're effectively public utility style institutions, but they don't have a duty to offer equal terms of service. So they can just demonetize you. They can kick you off. You have no recourse and they have no legal obligation here. So that's problem one. And you saw that, I think when they kicked a bunch of conservatives off, you know, you saw it even deeper when they did that to parlor. And so you, you can look at this and you can say, well, this is really scary because you have a small group of people, small number of firms that control who gets to speak online, which is basically who gets to speak, period. On the other hand, you have the fact that people were on Parler organizing violence. And so you don't want that, right? And this creates a dilemma that I think you're pointing to. And I think the answer is that, you know, first of all, you have to make sure that everybody gets equal access to these systems, Right. If you're and but equal access doesn't mean unvarnished access. If you are doing illegal things like engaged in fraud, incitement, 
intentional infliction of emotional distress, harassment, um, any number of other sort of traditional product liability, like um, harm, you know, just harmful behavior, you should be held accountable for that, especially if you're making money off of it. So the reason that that's not happening is because of a law called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which says that if you are a platform, then none of those claims can apply to you. Now, if you got rid of that law, it's not that these platforms would be held accountable for all this stuff. It's that people could bring lawsuits and say, you are making money doing this thing or that thing or this other thing. And then they would have to defend themselves or they would have to change their business model. And that to me makes the most sense. It's just say, if you are making, like nobody is like, oh, we really Verizon needs to get a hold of these, these riots, right? Because nobody blames Verizon or AT&T because they're not, they just deliver a neutral service, right? That you pay for. But Facebook and Google and Twitter are both delivering a communication service and they are manipulating you so they can sell advertising, which creates a different dynamic, but they are shielded like Verizon and AT&T who are not manipulating you, they're just overcharging you. Um, they, uh, they are shielded from legal liability and they should be like what AT&T or Zoom, right? Like they're not responsible for what we're talking about. Same with AT&T. However, Facebook and Google and Twitter, YouTube are making money off of what we talk right. about and are manipulating us. So they shouldn't get immunity. And we need to develop new legal doctrine to say, when you're making money from something, are, you know, you're kind of liable for it. Like distributor of a books, not the publisher of books. Like that's the legal doctrine that we need to develop. And we need to say, if you're doing illegal things, you get equal unaccess to all these platforms, but these are le- public choices. They're not made in the Silicon Valley boardrooms. They're made in, in US courtrooms where everyone gets access. Well, right. well and, Matt, oh. Oh, I just want to just reiterate, yeah. just to make that absolutely clear. When we talk about stuff on Zoom, we could be talking about really boring, dry stuff or super titillating stuff. Zoom does not make any more money one way or another. Correct. But Correct. if we do this on Facebook, uh, if we're doing this on YouTube, YouTube's going to make more money if we are more sensationalists or going in certain directions and whatnot, and they're going to develop their algorithm to, to enhance that. So and they're me- also going to control it. So they're going to ban certain things and they're going to demonetize certain things. And like- So they're manipulating our conversations in yes. some fashion yep. or another for profit. That's the right. bottom line. That's Emma, right. Emma, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. It, it, that That's a good clarification because I, I think, you know, Matt, the, the Section 230 point, it, it addresses one leg of it, right? Which is like the aggrievement presented by conservatives as particularly right now, uh, which I don't think is fully unfounded that without any kind of oversight, they can be kicked off of these platforms. But the, the, the other bigger section, and, and I think the more consequential one that I think of is just obviously the dissemination of mass disinformation that that is a massive problem that I had kind of poo-pooed in, in, in uh, you know, years past, but clearly uh, resulted in something like what we're seeing. And so I, I feel like antitrust could be the only way to actually address that. And that's might be the second leg of it. Is that I, some, you, something you agree with? I totally agree with that. And I also think that if you look at something like um, you can, you can very much see that the the distinction between, because it's there's anti-monopoly policy and Section 230 gives platforms a competitive advantage over institutions, media institutions that have to be held accountable for what they're doing. So for example, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a, that the My Pillow guy was on Newsmax and was talking the other are day. You, are you kidding? Of course Did we see not. that? Did we yeah. see that? Yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, Anyway, he, did you see? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know how to turn these things off on my machine. I'm sorry about that. Um, the uh, the my pillow guy was saying, you know, about the voting machines, and they like basically didn't let him talk. The reason for that is because they're facing a defamation suit from Dominion, Dominion Voting. Defamation is a restriction on speech, but it's a restriction on speech that we tolerate because we recognize that injuring people by damaging intentionally lying to damage their reputation should be illegal. Now, so they didn't, so you saw that Newsmax stopped, stopped it, wouldn't put it out anymore. If we, if we said, okay, Facebook, I'm sorry, I'm really gonna have to jump. Okay. If we said Facebook um, was liable for that, they would, they would change their behavior pretty dramatically. So that, that's the distinction. 
Exactly. All right. Well, uh, Matt Stoller, we will pick up this conversation at a, another time. Uh, folks should check out your uh, Substack big. We'll put a link to that. And of course, uh, your book, Goliath. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot.